let's talk about multiplayer virtual reality games. We talked about the setting being rendered as required uniquely to each player. In a virtual reality game like World of Warcraft, you notice that the setting's being rendered for each player because you will turn a corner and you'll notice suddenly mountains appearing in the background. You can actually see the mountains growing up in the background. That's because their server is slow. Our server is very fast. You know, I told you our little delta T's were you know, 10 to the minus 44 seconds, so we don't get that kind of delay in ours. But nonetheless, each individual gets their own data stream, okay? gets their own reality. It is a multiplayer game. The uh, setting, which is the stage, props, bodies, evolve from the PMR rule set and the big digital bang. Okay, well, what's the big digital bang? You have a consciousness information system. It would like to create a virtual reality for its consciousness to interact in so it could get traction and context to the, to the data being sent back and forth, just like we do in our simulations. When we simulate big bangs and things in our computers, we have a lot of energy at one spot, right? And then we let it expand and it coalesces in gravity and you, that happens in our computers as well. We have models like that. Well, this is just a model. So it starts out with a set of initial conditions. There's a few initial conditions. It starts out with a rule set, how things can change, how energy can be exchanged, how things affect each other. And then you press the start button and the computer starts and the simulation evolves. And now you have the same sort of thing. All that little tight energy that you simulated expands. Gravity coalesces. You end up with suns and stars and then planets and eventually a place like this. Eventually you get those, those proteins that come together and you have cells and you end up with us. Our set, if you will, has evolved. It's an evolved set, not a manufactured set. So it's not like somebody has to build the set like they would for a play. You just start some initial conditions, a little ball of energy, and you let it run. And it evolves this set. So now if your rule set wasn't a good rule set, what would happen? Well, it wouldn't evolve anything very interesting, right? It may not coalesce into this kind of a reality set. Well, then you change the initial conditions a little, give it a little more energy, a little less, you know, fine tune a few of the constants that you set and try it again. Well, eventually you have one that works. It simulates this. This is the result. So we don't have to construct the set like World of Warcraft programmers had to construct their set. So our set is infinitely more refined and detailed. Our physics is very detailed, our science, our biology, because it all evolved to be how it is. Okay, we know that the future exists in probability, remains that way, unrendered, until gameplay requires it, until some player requires the data. Now we saw that with quantum mechanics, right? They, they required the data, they made the measurement where those photons were, and when they got the measurement of the photon, then they had a photon that created that particle, collapsed the wave function, the probability wave into a physical particle. We do the very same thing. In this world of Warcraft, each player is getting a data stream to their computer. And if that player looks to the right, it sees what's to the right. It doesn't have what's to the left coming in this data stream. Obviously, its own data stream is just what it's aware of. We work the same way. Now, the larger consciousness system knows, in terms of probably, what's possible, what's likely, and what's important. Okay, the set of possibilities are represented statistically. You have to have two things. You have to have a consistent and continuous history. We mentioned that yesterday. And it has to abide by the rule set. So when you get that data stream, when you look and you get that data stream, the data stream has to provide you data that's consistent with the data it gave you before. Right? So you have to have a historical continuity and, and history. And it has to give you data that provides you something that abides by the rule set. You can't suddenly flap your arms and start to fly or you know, things don't fall up. It has to be consistent with the rule set. Okay. Now. We're going to get a little more into the, to the uh, nature of virtual reality. If you're in the world of Warcraft or in the Sims, do these games have to render oxygen for their players? And you say, well, that's ridiculous. Of course not. These are just made up 
players inside the computer, right? They're just computer images. Why would you have to render oxygen for them? Well, you know, if you've played those games, you know that if you fall into a swimming pool in The Sims and you don't have a ladder to get out, or if you fall into a river or a lake in World of Warcraft and you don't know how to swim, you drown. Well, why do you drown? Not enough oxygen under the water, right? That's why you drown. Well, the point here is, is that you don't have to simulate details. You only have to simulate effects. So they simulate the effect of oxygen. Well, it's the same here. Simulating details take up a whole lot of computer cycles and calculation space that's not necessary. We're getting a data stream that we interpret as this. There's absolutely no need to render oxygen unless somebody has a microscope or something that can actually see oxygen. Then you render oxygen. In this room, there's no need to render any oxygen in this room at all, because none of us can see oxygen in this room. But you render the effects. And how do you render the effects? You render them with probability. Is it probable that there would be oxygen in this room? Well, we haven't cut down all the trees yet. We haven't poisoned the oceans to the point that there isn't any plankton. So yes, there's oxygen in the atmosphere, and there's a probability that it is. And we make the measurement. We breathe. Well, I haven't fallen over yet, so you know that's the result. The measurement says that there probably is enough oxygen we made the measurement, and we go on. Oxygen doesn't have to be rendered. See, we assume all that detail is there. There's no need for it to be there. It just wastes computer cycles. I know, this is getting stranger and stranger, right? But uh, we're, we'll... Uh, music yeah. <laughs> Anybody hear the music playing? Okay. That's the same with everything. <coughs> Okay. So you have to get this idea that you're a, that your body in this physical reality, that this is a virtual reality game. What's rendered to you is just what you take in with your senses. Okay. When you make measurements with your senses, something gets rendered there. And that has to be historically consistent, and it has to suit the rule set, fit the rule set. Those are the two things that have to fit. Now, when something is rendered, there's just those, those two rules I told you about. And these criteria for these two rules are, have to be specific to the situation. It's like a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, we all get our own data stream. So it has to do with us. It has to do with what we see. So right now, what's behind me isn't being rendered in my data stream because I'm not sensing any of it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not there, or that it disappears or whatever. We're just in a virtual reality. I don't need it because I'm not sensing it. So it's not in my data stream. What's in my data stream is what's out here. And the same for you. You're all looking this way. The view of the city and the light coming in the windows is not in your data stream. It doesn't have to be. You're not sensing it. Okay, so you get that kind of idea about how we're, how we're going through reality. But there's a multiplayer game, so we're not the only person here. So we're no different than those World of Warcraft or Sims characters. You know, our sense of physical realness is an illusion. What is probable according to our rule set is enforced. Consistency is required just as in the Sims. All right, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the, a, uh, kind of an age-old riddle that you've all heard and uh, we've all had fun with. We probably wrote it off as a semantics issue, but now you're going to get the, the, the real story on this, and that is, if a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the real answer to that is, there is no tree, there is no woods, no listener, they're all virtual, statistical, and probabilistic. Okay, here's how that works. We take the before case, a person walks into a woods. When they walk into that woods, they see a tree that's dead, that's standing. Maybe wobbling a little bit, but standing. Okay? And why do they see that? Because when they walk into that woods and look, that's what was probable. Okay? It was probable that that woods would be there. It's, you know, it has to be consistent. If it was a woods there yesterday, then there's going to be a woods there today. You know? It's that sort of thing, unless somebody cuts it down, and then that's part of the history. And they looked at that when they saw that dead tree. It was probable because of 
you know, the, the probability, the future probability, of course, has that in it. And they look, and there's that dead tree because it's probable. Now they leave, and they go away, and they come back five years later, and they walk into the woods, and they see this dead tree laying on the ground, not standing up. Okay. Why do they see it laying on the ground? Because that's probable. They made the measurement, and it goes into the probability, future probability database. It says, oh, it was a dead tree. Let's see, five years ago it was wobbling, you know, storms, weather, all this kind of stuff. It's really likely it's going to be laying on the ground. So when they render it, it's rendered laying on the ground. You see, it didn't have to fall because that's not the way reality works. It was rendered standing up because that was probable. It was rendered lying on the ground because that was probable. See, that's how reality works. You don't have to go through progressive states to get from one to the other. It's just you take the measurement and you get what's likely. And the way that works, like we said before, is that you take all the states that are possible. By possible, I mean they're consistent with the history and they fit the rule set. Those are all the possibilities. And you select one. You randomly select one. And that's what you get when you make the measurement. And they're not all the same. Could be this way, could be that way. But they all have to be historically consistent. They all have to fit with the rule set. And then up comes one. Okay, so that's the way reality works. Same way that photons were created by the act of measuring them. Okay, so is an oxygen atom molecule you know, or a dead tree standing created the act of measuring it. All right, well these, the reason this is so hard to understand is because you have cultural beliefs about the nature of reality and cultural beliefs are very difficult to let go of. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about cultural beliefs. This is gonna be a little series of cartoons that are going to try to give you a, an intuitive sense about cultural beliefs. Okay, so here you are, you're the little happy face in the middle. In our culture, everything is physical and everything is external to us, right? We're here and everything else is something else, different from us. Okay, so we want to try to conceptualize that we're part of the larger consciousness system. You know, we want to be one with the server, right? Well, here we are, that's us. We're trying to be one with all there is, but we need to be separate at the same time. So we put ourselves up on little sticks so that we can be one and be separate at the same time. All right, next one. So there's us trying to be one with our higher self, or oversoul, but needing to be separate at the same time. There we are still up on that little stick. Okay, let's go again. Here we are trying to be one with those that we love, but needing to be separate at the same time. So there's our loved ones, but there's us. We're still up on our little stick, right, because we have to be separate, connected, but still separate. Well, here's the picture that uh, is more accurate. Here's what you really are. Now, if you look at that and you say, okay, actually, I'm this one right over here. These are, you know, that's me. Then you're missing the point. All you've done is shorten the stick. That's not the point. The point is that this is what you are. You are really are one with the larger consciousness system. Okay? Now, look over here at this set, higher self, Oversoul, above that is individuated unit of consciousness, and above that is the larger consciousness system. Now, notice I put them all, it's like a Venn diagram, you know, each one's containing the other one. But those are arbitrary groupings. They don't really exist as separate things. Okay, it's not separate. We just turn them into all these different separate categories so we have something to talk about because if that's our nature because we believe the same reason we put ourselves up on that little stick we can't conceptualize something unless we make it different than us you know it's us and everything else so we break it up into these free will awareness unit of higher self over souls independent unit of consciousness larger conscious system and we see these as all separate things and then we have a certain place and there's this hierarchy and here we are and then we have to move from here to here see we break that all up that's our cultural beliefs that make us break everything up into pieces, draw lines between them, you know, make diagrams out of everything, and then make the connections. It's not like that. This is the way it is. We're just all one thing. Now, you as a unique individuated unit of consciousness do have individuality. Okay? Continuity of being is required for cumulative learning. 
but you're not a separate thing. You are an evolving collection of experience, data, rules, patterns, memory, processing capability with a specific level of entropy that you're trying to decrease. You're a distributed cell of the larger consciousness system. Okay, so if you need a, a guide, one forms up out of the system. Guide is simply a metaphor in your mind. Okay, the guide is just one information interface that you have with the larger consciousness system. Your intuition is another interface you have with the larger consciousness system. You interpret guide as a separate being because that's the only way you can conceive of something you're communicating to. You know, we don't communicate with rocks. We don't communicate with you know, things like that. So if we're communicating, we're getting data, oh, well, then that's a being. That's how we define the being. That's somebody that sends us data. So when we run into beings out in the larger reality, guess what? They kind of have heads and shoulders and arms and legs, and they look just like us, except different, of course. So that's you creating that. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the data you receive from other. Okay. So if you need a guide, a guide just forms up. All of you know what I'm talking about, about guides. This is kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the non-physical uh, beings that we interface with. Well, they just form up. It's not like there's this being out there that's just hanging around, watching everything you do and everything you think, and that's its whole job. I mean, what a boring job, right? We must really be important to have a slave like that. Obviously not. It's just a metaphor for our interface with the larger consciousness system. Now, it doesn't mean that metaphor can't be consistent. It doesn't mean that metaphor won't have a sense of humor. You know, it doesn't mean that, that that's now going to be a, you know, like talking to a computer. It's not. It's talking to the larger consciousness system. Okay. So instead of imposing our beliefs and physical reality structure on the larger consciousness system, our beliefs being that everything that exists has to be separate, instead of imposing those on the larger consciousness system, let those physical matter reality generated beliefs assumptions go. Let your guides just form up out of the system on demand, just as you form up out of the system on demand in order to participate in this reality system. Okay, now think of a computer file. You know, we're talking about an information system, right? Think of a, of, a, of a Word file that you have. So you do a Word document and then you go save. Where is that document? Do you think it's a little bunch of ones and zeros stuck someplace in a corner of your hard drive? No. Those ones and zeros are spread all over that hard drive. They're not all put in one place. They're strewn anywhere that hard drive happened to be at the time it was ready to write those ones and zeros. They're all over. That's why eventually you have to defrag the hard drive, right? Defragment it because things are spread so widely and so interspersed that it becomes inefficient for the drive to go find it because it just drops it wherever it happens to be at the time. That's a much more efficient process than having to go someplace every time you, you know, have to take all those ones and zeros to the same spot because that spot isn't standing still. So that's the way it is. You're really spread all over the consciousness system too. You're just, what do we say? Data, processing, memory, okay? Don't think of yourself necessarily as a separate thing up on a stick. You're just part of that larger concept. When you hear these words, we're all one, it's a lot more literally true than you think, okay? So you are consciousness experiencing a virtual reality generated by consciousness. The system is designed to facilitate its own evolution by providing a physical reality where experience and feedback facilitates evolution. And we're going to talk a little bit about that feedback. Consciousness has a thing called intent. Okay? Intent is like the motive force of consciousness. That's what you think. You might call it your will. Okay? Now intent is not really the same as a wish. A wish is kind of idle and noisy. Intent, what I'm talking about, is like a low noise, focused thought. Not just kind of random jabber going on in your mind. So conscious intent changes the probabilities. Remember, you're a consciousness experiencing a virtual reality generated by consciousness. So you really have a creative 
part here. You're not only the subject, but you're also, you know, you're, you're the creator and the experiencer. You can work both ends because you're consciousness. All right, you're in this virtual reality, some of you, you know, but <coughs> some of you are elsewhere, but right now, but anyway. So let's talk about the uh, things that we do that kind of show this. You know, when we talk to our, we talk to our plants, right? Some people have green thumbs, some people have black thumbs. The people with green thumbs are the people who really care about their plants. You know, they have a relationship with their plants. They change the probability of how those plants do because of the attitude they have about their plants. They care about them. The people who have black thumbs are the people who forget to water them you know, for, for weeks and weeks in a row because they really don't care a whole lot about those plants. Those plants are just, I know they like them all right, but it's not a personal relationship with the plant. Okay, so that's an aspect of that. When we were in Toronto, Dennis uh, told us that uh, he makes parking spaces open up. And I know a lot of people do this when they drive into a place like this, you know, a big city where parking is very, very scarce and hard to find. You start at home before you even leave with a mental construct that you're going to have a parking space when you get there. And you can see the picture that you're just driving up and you turn the corner and there's somebody going to be backing out just as you turn, you know, and you'll get that parking space. And if you put enough energy into that, you put enough effort into it and you get a real clear intent, you can make that happen about 80% of the time you'll get that parking space. In New York City, they probably hail cabs the same way. When you go out to get a cab, you have some sense that when you walk out on that street, a cab's going to be pulling up. They're going to be coming by. So we go back to about 1957, and we have Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. You know, this is not new. You know, this is obvious. We know that people who are very positive, who have these positive attitudes, you know, we say, well, they're lucky. Every time they go out and want a cab, there's a cab, you know, and every time, you know, they get these parking spaces, and we don't. Well, if you think negative about it, if you say, oh, I'm going to go out there and there's not going to be a cab, well, you're not helping yourself any. You see, you're not biasing the probabilities in your favor because once you go out there and make a measurement, you, you'll see whether there's a cab out there or not. Okay, so you bias the probabilities of that plant growing, of that parking space coming out, of that cab showing up. What about the placebo effect? Okay, the placebo effect has been known now for probably about, well, I think it was probably World War II, maybe World War I. It was first discovered by, by an army uh, nurse who ran out of uh, painkiller, and she didn't have the heart to tell those people who had missing limbs and things that there was no more painkiller. So she just injected them with salt water or something and said, oh, you're going to feel better now, honey, you know. And they did. They really did, you know. And uh, it was a big, you know, it was a big thing. Then they did studies on it later and found out the placebo effect is real. And now, in order for a drug to become saleable, it has to beat the placebo effect. In other words, you need double-blind experiments and you need to show that your drug is better than, you know, sawdust pills. I don't like sugar. <laughs> Sawdust pills, cellulose pills. No. So it's the, you have the situation where the doctor passes out, you know, as a control group, and he passes out the, the sawdust pills, and he passes out the, the, the real medicine that's trying to get a license to be marketed, and he says exactly the same words to everybody. That's important. Exactly the same words. Here's a new pill. It's a brand new medicine. You know, we're testing to see how it works. It's really wonderful. You know, our initial tests say great things about it. Here are your pills and here are your pills and so on. Except half of them get sawdust and the other half get the medicine. And they find out that it's really hard to beat the placebo effect. Matter of fact, it's getting harder and harder as time goes on. Many pills that beat the placebo effect 20 years ago can't anymore. It's changing. So. Why does the placebo effect work? It's the same thing. You're modifying the probabilities in that future probable database. You know, you're going to take a measurement. You're going, to get a, you're going to get something to happen. You're modifying the probability of what's going to happen with your intent. So if your intent is very positive, oh, I'm taking this new wonderful pill and I'm going to get better, well, about 30, 35% of the people get better. And it's not that they just think they're better. It's not that that, uh, that wounded uh, veteran just thought he wasn't feeling any pain, you know. He actually didn't feel as much pain because he got that salt water in his veins. 
Okay, placebo effect, a very powerful, real effect. That's why that works. Well, then that gets us to things like prayer. Isn't that the same thing? You know, people have a very uh, focused intent on something happening, and that takes us to uh, this law of attraction. You know, the big secret. Yeah, the law of attraction. And uh, it works the same way. You can modify the probability of what's going to happen with your intent. That's how psychic healing, mental healing takes place. It's the same thing. You modify what's going to happen, how that disease develops or it goes away with intent, changes the probabilities. When the measurement's taken, which is, you know, when they take the x-rays, when they, you know, when you go to the doctor and he sees what state your health's in or whatever, you get a, you get a reality. The wave function collapses and you get a result into the physical reality. Now, once you get that result, again, just like the photon, it's got to stay here, and from then on, you have to be historically consistent and has to abide by the rule set. Okay, now, why it doesn't always work? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, some people are better at focusing their intent than others. Some have a lot of mental noise, and any of you who've tried to meditate, you know when you first start to meditate, mental noise is a really big problem. You've, you find out when somebody tells you, clear your mind and have no thoughts, what a difficult job that is. Suddenly, you can do that for maybe you know, two or three seconds at a time, right? And then thoughts come in. So having a clear, focused intent is something that is very difficult for most people. Their mind is just full of constant noise. Well, you can't get much signal if you've got all that noise in there. So that's part of why it doesn't work. Another part is that things like the, um, the car or the placebo effect, okay, these are kind of stuff rather than people. I, th I told you that you can affect the probability. It doesn't necessarily mean that you always affect the outcome because you reach in to all those things that are possible that still match with history, match with the rule set, and there may be a hundred different versions of that. You pick one. You don't always pick a winner. You know, it doesn't always come out the way you want. There are other possibilities. So it doesn't always work, partly because of the focus, partly because that's the way the system works. So conscious intent is the motive force within a consciousness system. You're both the creator and the experiencer. So you see there's this feedback loop. Your conscious intent, so you drive present choices, right? You make a choice. The choices you make changes the choices you get next. Right? You go down this path instead of that path. You see there's a feedback system. So you make choices. Those choices affect future choices. And you have intent. Your intent modifies the probability of those future choices to be more probable or to be less probable. Well, that's kind of how the, how the system works. So in a way, we say well, you create your own reality. Well, in many ways you do. In a few ways you don't. It's a multiplayer game. Everybody else here has free will as well. So we don't create our own reality as far as making everybody else act the way we'd like them to. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'd all like to do that. But and that's not how it works. Everyone has free will. So we don't create our own reality in total. But look at the ways we do create it. One, remember those little conscious and up there talking and all they could do was interpret based out of their own experience set and they could only give data based out of their own set? Well, if you only interpret based out of your own experience set, you're creating your own reality there. You're limiting it to just what's in your experience set. Okay, so that's one way you create your own reality. You interpret it. Another way you create your own reality is that you modify the probabilities of what happens. It's part of the feedback. Another way you create your own reality is by interacting with other people. You modify how they react to you. So you're interactive. You modify what they do. They modify what you do. So you're a nice, loving, sweet person that takes care of everybody and, uh, and thinks about other people. People tend to like you. They like being around you. you know, you're a nice person. You happen to be a grouchy person. You happen to use people, take advantage of people, always see what you can get out of them. People avoid you. They don't like you, you know. So you're creating your own reality. You're creating the way people interface with you. There's a lot of ways you create your own reality. But you have to deal with what comes as well. Everything is not the way it is because it's part of a plan. There's a lot of randomness still here. There's a lot of that social brownie emotion we talked about going on. There's a lot of random things that happen. 
One last thing, I guess a couple of last things, but we'll take them in order, about the law of attraction. I talked about that, and I said, yeah, that does work. And what that's about is that you use your focused intent to make things happen that you want. Unfortunately, an awful lot of that is ego-based. What you want is that new Mercedes. What you want, you know, is a, is a, you know, a richer boyfriend or a prettier girlfriend or something like that. So it's a lot of ego-based stuff. Well, you have a system that allows you to modify the probabilities with your intent. You also have a system, the whole purpose of which is for you to evolve, and that means getting rid of ego, getting rid of fear. Remember, ego, fear, those were those things that created hell, right? That created the, the environment that didn't evolve very quickly. Okay, so what you're here for is to get rid of that ego, to become love. So you have a system that's trying to get rid of your ego, trying to help you learn and grow, and the same system that kind of will change the probabilities to help you get what you want, because that's part of the feedback. If you pit the system against itself, use that feedback to feed your ego, you see, now you're getting the system to work against itself, and if you do that, it's not that you can't do it, but most likely that system will teach you a lesson in the process. It probably won't be pretty. I have two examples. A man who wanted $100,000, and he wanted that $100,000 just worse than anything. His life would be perfect if he had $100,000, and that would all, all it would take. So he thought about it. He was into the law of attraction. He said, I'm going to track that $100,000. So for, for about four months, he thought $100,000. And he saw in his mind there was a man dressed in a suit who walked down an aisle and handed him a check for $100,000. And he kept on that image, and he thought about it, and he worked on it. And in, a, in some time, his mother and father and both his brother and sister and all of their children all died together in an automobile accident. He was the sole heir. And guess what? That man in that suit did walk down that corridor and hand him a check for $100,000. That's a heck of a price to pay for getting $100,000. See, there's a lesson there about ego. And when I gave that story to, in California, a guy came up and he says, you know, he says, I finally understand it now, but reality has been joking with me and playing games with me my whole life. He says he was doing this, this uh, law of attraction, and he said he saw himself as a, he wanted to be a stronger, tougher guy, right? He wanted to be more masculine, more tougher. So he saw himself in his mind, this is what he wanted, as being a muscle guy, big, you know, and he, in relative to this little lady, you know, who was much smaller and whatever. So he just had this image of him, the big, strong, tough, muscular man, and this little, tiny girl, this little small woman who was with him, and of course, thought he was so big and strong and so on. So this was his mind image, and he worked on that, figured he was gonna create that reality. You know what happened? His wife got anorexia. She became, and he noticed it. One day he looked at his wife and he saw that same image that he had in his mind. There he was, and he was huge compared to her. She was so tiny, and he goes, ah, that's it, you know. I've done this. Now, this, is, this, is, this was my, my vision. So that's why he came up and said life's been playing tricks on him and having fun with him, you know, uh, his whole life. So you can change the realities. You can get what you ask for, but don't ask the system to work against itself. You probably won't like the solution. So, yes, law of attraction works, but if what you're trying to attract is just degrandizing your ego, it, uh, it's not that you have to worry so much about what you, what you want to attract and what you wish for. You have to worry about why you want it, why you want to wish for it. That's the, that's the key. Okay, um, another example. Let's say that the larger consciousness system, according to the rule set, calculates that a lump is going to form on someone's neck. Okay, we're going to get a lump forming over here. And that, that's very probable. Okay, according to the rule set, that's just going to be probable. I mean, we might say, uh, to make that reasonable, let's say this person had exposure to asbestos 15, 20 years ago. Okay, now the rule set, biology, you know, all of that, science, says, all right, it's likely to get a lump. Okay, so the lump forms. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty at this point as to just what that lump is. Just somebody's got a lump on their neck. Guy goes to the doctor and he has a biopsy. Okay, that's a measurement, right? When he takes a measurement, now there's a lot less uncertainty, isn't there? But still some uncertainty. You know, what if they got the samples mixed up? 
What if, uh, you know, the biopsy equipment was contaminated? You know, there's still some uncertainty. So it goes to four more doctors and they all do biopsies. Well, now there's even less uncertainty, isn't there? Okay, let's say all those biopsies indicate that there's a deadly tumor. That's always deadly. 100% of the time, people have this tumor die. Say they die in, you know, two months. Okay, now, the uncertainty of the outcome is very small. Okay, there's very little wiggle room for modifying the probabilities. You've got this big probability now that you'd have to work down, right? Whereas in the beginning, there wasn't any big probability. Not in this reality, not yet. Well, now let's look at some of the details here. Does that mean that you should not go to the doctor? You should just use your mind to work on it? No. Why? Because left alone, that lump is going to progress according to the rule set, right? It's not, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not that if you close your eyes, everything will go away. You know, you still have a rule set and you still have history. That lump is still going to progress according to the rule set and that exposure. But it doesn't necessarily have to be cancerous, now does it? There are people who get exposed to asbestos and they don't get cancer. You know, so it's not like that's a certainty. So you got more wiggle room. All, all we're saying here then is that if you want to work on things, if you'd like to change things in your life by using your intent, better to do it up front and early rather than after you're in a jam. See, most of us wait until we're in a jam and then we go, oh man, I gotta do something about this. By then, most of your options have already played out. Where you have the most effect by using your intent is early on, before you get into the jam, when there's still lots of choices to be made. See, So when that lump comes is the time to start working on that lump. So when you do get that biopsy, which you probably need to get because the rule set's working there, you know, it, it gave you a lump, now it's going to give you something else eventually. So uh, that's the time to apply your mind to it. Now, what about a doctor with a negative attitude? What about the doctor who looks at that lump and right away, you know, he's a pessimist. So right away he looks at it and says, oh, I bet that's cancerous. And what about the doctor who's, a, who's an optimist? You know, looks at that lump and says, well, it's probably just benign. Now, if you take those two doctors, you will find that the one that's a pessimist has a higher percentage of lumps turn into cancer than the doctor who's the optimist. And that's even if the doctor doesn't say anything. Now, if the doctor communicates that to the patient, if he says that out loud, oh, that's probably cancer, or, oh, that's probably just benign, you see. Now you get the placebo effect working in favor, right? Now you got, you've given a guy a positive attitude. Oh, that's nothing to worry about. I'll feel better about it. If he says the opposite, if he says, oh, that's a, no, I've seen tumors like that, that you know, you're, you're gone for, you know, if you tell that to the patient, then you've got the placebo effect still working in the opposite direction. So the placebo effect can work either way. It's not just it only has to work positive. You can make people sick as well as you can heal people with mind. So would you rather go to an optimistic or a pessimistic doctor? You know, just that attitude will make a difference. Now I've done research with that. They've done research with doctors and they found out that bedside manner is very important to whether or not the patients get better or not. You know, so this is kind of scientific fact that the attitude of the doctor. Now, what about uh, school teachers? There's another study that you've probably all heard about that you give a, you tell a teacher, the kids in your class are a little substandard. You know, they're really not too bright, uh, but uh, you know, do your best you can with them. Those kids, even though it was a mixed group, right? Random kids all drawn out just randomly. You know, they're all the same. You got 10 groups of kids that are all randomly drawn from the same pool. pool and you just tell these teachers different things. And what happens, the teachers that are told that their students aren't as bright, those students end up later, now let's say this is first, second, third, fourth grade, they end up testing lower IQ, they end up getting lower grades on test scores, you know, comprehensive test scores that they give everybody, okay? And the teacher that gets told, you've got the bright bunch, you know, these, these kids are all really smart, so, you know, really should you know, have, them, have them do their stuff, those kids will come with higher IQs and they'll get higher test scores. And this has been repeated many times where they take random samples of kids and just tell the teacher different things. And you know what we believe? We believe that it's because of the way the teacher treats the kids. It's some way that the teacher 
influences them by what she says and how she says it, and her attitude actually changes them. Have you ever tried to influence a kid? They're not that easy. Yes, they can pick up some subtle clues, but they're really not that, that easy to influence in fundamental ways like that. They kind of are who they are. What's going on is that teacher is using that intent, and that intent is just her attitude to modify something that's very uncertain. Children are very uncertain, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of uncertainty. They have a lot of growing to do. Where you have a lot of uncertainty, you have a lot of opportunity to affect things. Where you have little wiggle room, little uncertainty, there's little you can do to affect things. Okay, so you see, a teacher's attitude is important just like your doctor's attitude. It makes a difference. Your kids will be smarter, get higher scores, have higher IQs, just because they're at that age where there's so much uncertainty about them and how they will grow and how they will develop that you can modify that. Okay, so now you have the parents who get, see the research about, uh, oh, hang a mobile over your crib, you know, your child's crib, because that enriches his environment and it makes them smarter. Okay, well, that may well be true because it gives them a rich environment, but you know there's another thing going on too. You have a parent who's really interested in that kid being smarter and doing things for that child so it'll develop. You have a lot of positive energy being put into that child's development as well as giving him a richer environment. There's two things going on there. It's not just the mobile, it's the attitude of the parent and the, the moving things over the crib together that makes the difference, you see. So suddenly you start to think, uh-oh, I better pay attention to what I'm thinking and my attitudes and the attitudes of the people that I hang out with, et cetera. You know, this is, uh, you know, this is actually serious. And it's true. It is serious. Okay, now these are easy experiments to do, and some of them have been done. Now, the ones with education, you know, these have been done. The ones with doctors, these have been done. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit more about synchronicity and other anomalies of a statistically based system. We know that the system only has to compute the probability of the next thing happening according to the rule set and history. Now, if you have uncertainty in the rule set or uncertainty in the history, that gives the system multiple solutions, right? We said that you take all the, all the possibilities that meet history in the rule set and you select one from that. Well, if that's only one thing, well, that's the thing you're going to select because there's no wiggle room. If there's lots of uncertainty about it, then there's lots of selections you might get. And if that uncertainty is like this, like a square wave, then it doesn't matter. They're all the same. But if it's very different, you may get out of this tail, you know, something that's extreme that way, something's extreme the other way, but mostly you'll get out under the fat part of the curve because that's what statistics means, you know. That's what normal means is you're, you're liable to get out of the fat part of the curve. Okay, well, let's talk about weak history. A lot of us involved in things that have weak history. And I'll give you a, an example of that. You, uh, you know, you've, you've been traveling, you've been in an airplane, you've know, been away from home, let's say, for two weeks. Long trip home, you get back, get through the door. First thing you do, you've been in airports a lot, your throat's kind of scratchy and dry. You walk over to the refrigerator, you open the refrigerator door, because you want a beer, nice carbonated beverage when the throat would feel so good, and you look in there, and there's no beer in the refrigerator. And you think, I know there were beer in there. When I left two weeks ago, there was at least three or four beer in my refrigerator. So you wonder about how that could be. Could you have been mistaken? No, you remember the beer in the refrigerator. Ah, you know, I have a guy comes in, you know, takes care of my pets. He's drinking my beer, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. How many beer are in the refrigerator? Well, when you open the door, that's a measurement. You go to the probability distribution. You pull down a probability, and that's how many beer are going to be in there. Now, let's say that you took a picture. You opened the refrigerator door, and you took a picture just before you left, right? And then you lock up your house, and, you know, nobody comes in your house, let's say. And you come, you come back after it, and you open the refrigerator door. What are you going to get? Exactly what's in the picture, right? Because that's consistency. So if there were four beer in the refrigerator in that picture, you count one, two, three, four. You open the door, and there's four. Absolutely. Why? Because you have a probability function. It looks like this. It's a delta function. That peak is right over the number four, right? That's the only thing that can be in there because that data now is part of our history. That data has been taken. And here it is. It's in a photograph. So the probability is like that. But let's say you didn't take a picture. 
let's say you're like me, you know, memory starts to you know, fade a little bit, you know, once you get older and uh, you're not really too sure, you're pretty sure there was something in there. Well, now you've got a weak history. You don't have a picture. You open up that door, now the probability function sort of looks like this. So you're reaching and grab one, and there might be four, there might be five, there might be two, there might be none. You know, it's hard to say. We live in a probabilistic reality. We don't live in a deterministic, objective reality. So what about the, case, the times when you put down your glasses or your car keys, and you put them on your desk, you come back the next day, and you look on your desk, and they're not there? And you say, well, I remember, I put them right there on my desk, and they're not there. So you look all over the place, and you find them, uh, you know, maybe uh, in your bedroom. And you scratch your head and say, that doesn't make sense. I remember where I left them. You know, these things happen, right? When we were in the, the California workshop, the very day, the very next morning, after I gave this, this talk on the, on the Saturday, Bernie uh, Heisch, who's a physicist, he's an astrophysicist, and he said, I put in my contacts. And I said, I put, always put contact in my right eye first, because then I can use that to see better to put in the other one, because that's the way his eyes work. So he said, I put in my right eye, then I could see everything else. I put in my left eye, and then I noticed that he really couldn't see very well in my right eye. And I thought, oh no, it came out, you know, it fell out. And so he was searching on the floor, he was searching everywhere, and then he found it. He was sitting in his little contact lens bowl, right where it was supposed to be. And he looked at it and he said, I know, I put that in already. And it was sitting there, you know, in the little lens cap thing. So he put it in again, and it worked. But then he came back the very next day and he said, you know, just what you were telling us about happened. He says, I know I put that in because I could see well to put the other one in. I couldn't have seen well to put the other one in if I didn't do that. We said, but there it was. It wasn't, you know, it was back in, the, and it's just one of those things. We all have those kinds of things happen to us, where things kind of disappear, where they're supposed to be, appear someplace else, and sometimes never appear again at all. We live in a probabilistic reality. It's not as buttoned down. We all think it's objective and deterministic, but it's not. Where you have a weak history or a lot of randomness in the rule set, you grab that probability, you get whatever you get. Okay, now, let's talk about synchronicity. Because the system now has multiple solutions that fit the criteria of being able to collapse the wave function to a result. It can use that wiggle room, it can use those multiple solutions to help you evolve, which brings us to another point. The system really wants you to succeed. Why? Well, you're its strategy for evolving. As you evolve, it evolves. As you lower your entropy, it lowers its entropy. So it's made this nice, this nice uh, reality frame, the schoolhouse, for you, why wouldn't it also teach a little? Why wouldn't it also help you to learn these lessons? Well, it does. There's a thing called synchronicity where often just the right thing that you need at the right time just kind of falls in your lap. Let's go back to the guy with the beer. So he opens up the refrigerator and there's no beer in the refrigerator. And suddenly he kind of has this powerful thirst for a beer, right? Because that's what he was focused on. So he says, well, I'm going to go down to the local grocery store and I'm going to buy, buy some beer. So he goes down to the grocery store and he drives down a parking lot and he sees this empty space. So he drives by it and he's going to back into it, starts backing into it, and just about the time he has to turn around to look because he's just entering the space, he hears the crunch. Bang. He hits a car. So he looks in the mirror and there's a car sitting in that parking space. And it's like, how did that car get there? And then he thinks, a jerk, he just pulled in behind me as I was backing into it. And he pulled into that space. So then he looks and there's nobody in the car. There's no jerk. So he gets out to look at the damage. You know, he doesn't know what's going on. He looks at, and just about that time, here comes this person walking out of the grocery store. Been there a while, obviously, has a couple bags of groceries, and that's their car. Well, you know, they strike up a conversation, and, you know, this is synchronicity. You know, that person invites him to their meditation sessions or something that changes his life. That person becomes their soulmate. You know, they, they get married and uh, live happily ever after. That person, you know, uh, whatever, gives them a job, you know, makes a contact, lends them a book because they have a sim whatever it is. That's how synchronicity works. Okay, why didn't he see that? Why didn't he see that space? Why did it look empty? Well, the 
larger consciousness systems feeding you the data stream, isn't it? It basically can manipulate the details as long as it doesn't change any history, as long as it doesn't violate the rule set. That's synchronicity. And most of us experience those kinds of things. But these things happen more often to people who are ready to learn from them. Okay? If you're not ready to learn from it, if it's not a lesson there for you, if something happens kind of, you know, you're something that disappears from where you think it should be and appears someplace else, if these things happen to you, it's probably because it's a lesson that you're ready to learn. It's, a, it's kind of a wake up to say, you know, reality is larger than you think. People who have paranormal experiences, people who have deja vu, telepathy, you know, a prayer gets answered, uh, voices, uh, you know, they talk to dead relatives, you know, they get a, they, you know, somebody dies and, and then they get a fax or a phone message or something from that person in that person's voice, you know, after they had died. You know, these things happen, but they don't happen to people who aren't ready to learn something from them. And it's not the message, you know, they get the, you know, they get that phone message and it, it'll say something that means a lot to that individual, but it's not the message that counts. The message usually is nothing. It's, hello, I'm okay, or some little sort of thing like that. The message isn't the point. The point is to give you the experience to notice that reality is a lot stranger and bigger than you thought. It's a way to nudge you into a bigger view. It's to open your mind a little bit. That's why those things happen to you. So once you get to the point where you just live in the present moment, your ego is reduced, your fear is reduced, and you just live and let happen, you'll find synchronicity is like an every hour thing. It's not that it happens every once in a while, you live in it. It's there all the time. You know, just this happens and that happens and people come and go out of your life and it all just is beautifully orchestrated. So it happens to those who can gain something from it. And if on the other hand, all this stuff is a crock, you know, and it all doesn't make any sense and so on, and you make, you know, then why should, why should that happen? You know, the system isn't going to go out of its way to help you learn if you're not educable, if you're not open to it. So being open to it is the first step in experiencing it. Okay. Some implications. Physical reality doesn't have to be rendered at all unless someone needs that rendering. I think we already talked about it. Someone makes a measurement or an observation. Then they need the data in their data stream. Of course, now somebody, and this was another physicist, he said, yeah, but doesn't the, doesn't the system have to generate all the possibilities anyway? You know, like it has to calculate everything in order to know what's likely to happen. So isn't that just as big a problem as the deterministic problem of having to calculate everything? And it's like, no. This is a statistical reality. All it has to have is a statistical model. You know, there's a big difference between physics models and statistical models. If you're in the modeling business, you know there's a huge difference there. Physics model is extremely detailed. You know, it's all the physics down to the molecule. A statistical model kind of roughly models what happens statistically. Much simpler, much smaller, much faster, but not as accurate. Well, this doesn't have to be but so accurate. It just has to be accurate enough to meet those two criteria. Our history has to be continuous, and we have to abide by the rule set. That's all we have to meet. So you can use your lowest fidelity statistical model you need to uh, measure those kinds of things. For instance, if you believe that the universe is in a specific state at this instant, okay, the universe out there, all the molecules, all the atoms, of all the gas, and all the clouds, they're in some particular specific state right now, that's just a scientific belief. Okay, we did, on Friday night, we talked about how this is not an objective world, this is a statistical probabilistic world. When the astrophysicist looks out at the universe with his instruments, the future probable universe may be in any one of a million states. And it doesn't have to be figured very carefully now, does it? Not for us, because we don't have a lot of data. And maybe a million out of that zillion, the states will be very, very similar because the rule sets kind of focus things in. There's only certain kinds of things can happen within the rule set, right? That's restricted. So a whole lot of them may be very, very similar. But when he makes that measurement of that, looks through that telescope and sees that nebula or whatever's out there, 
What he is doing is collapsing probability wave function. He's making a measurement, and he gets a result. And from there on, consistency is required. That's what's out there. The next person that looks has to see something that's consistent with that. Same as a photon. So now we're looking at you know, nebulae, you know, star systems, work the same way as photons. You take the measurement, brings them into reality. Then they have to stay that way. So the system just has to generate a probability model. And for that, it needs to know the probability of what's going to happen next. For that, it needs to do this probable future database. Right? So that's why it's, that's required. It's not as hard as you think. First of all, because it has worked this probable future database out some n numbers of delta t's, it's got a little breathing room. It doesn't have to calculate everything instantly as the measurement's made. It's got a whole lot of work already done. All it has to do is progress changes. So that gives it a, that's a big load. That's a big workload from the throughput. Okay. It's got time. You know, also, it can, it knows what's coming. It can look at that probable reality and say, all right, you know, in the next whatever, we're likely to need this sort of data. And it can get working on it. So it can, it can develop the probability where it needs it. So there's no need to really produce these probabilities out, you know, 10 years, 100 years, or that kind of thing. It just, just as far as it, the system just needs to do it as far as it needs to do it. And it doesn't mean that in every area it's progressed exactly the same. It only progresses it in areas where it sees it's going to need the data. So it doesn't have to do it everywhere. Okay? Everything does not have to be assessed in full detail or precision all of the time. It only needs to give you the data that you require. So if you look at something with a telescope, suddenly it needs to give you more data than if you looked at it without that telescope. If you're looking at something a mile away, you pick up the telescope, you get more data rendered. Put down the telescope, you get less data rendered. Okay, with the scope, you can see the leaves on the trees. Without the scope, all you see is these kind of green smeary things. Okay, so the amount of data you get is different. Of course, that's a problem for psi researchers because local violations, of course, can be allowed. Okay, the system may allow local exceptions to the rule set as long as the rule set is maintained at the system level. Okay, now that's a corollary to my memory, you know, not being good enough for proof for how many beer are in the refrigerator. The reason that that probability function was broad was because that's the way my memory is. You know, my memory isn't too sharp. I don't have that photographic memory. If I had a photographic memory, then I'd know what was in there, and I'd open that door, and that's what it would be, because I would have the data. I rem have a photographic memory, and I remember there were four beer in the refrigerator. Open the door, there's going to be four beer in there. I have a memory of a 64-year-old guy, I mean a 65-year-old guy, <clears throat> who doesn't know how old he is. See? <laughs> memory, right? I have a memory problem, and I don't know exactly what's in there. I just know there's some in there. So now I've got this broad probability function. So it's individual, it's case by case, and the uncertainty had to do with my uncertainty, right? With the uncertainty of my memory. Well, it's the same thing kind of on the other side of this is that if there's uncertainty in the system, that often is enough that you can have exceptions that are local, okay? Now, the way that works, this possibility leads basically to the psi uncertainty principle. Okay. If the psi event is not seen as objective by the larger physical reality, that is that the rule set is not objectively violated at the system level, then the event can be allowed as an exception. So you may be able to levitate a box of rocks in your living room, but if 60 minutes shows up, along with a couple other networks and wants to watch you levitate the box of rocks, chances are you won't be able to, you see. Because now, if you did, you would create a problem with the rule set because box of rocks aren't supposed to float. They're supposed to sink, you see. Before, it really wasn't a problem because you were alone in your living room and you made your box of rocks go up and down. Well, that's okay. It doesn't really affect much, just you. So you see, there's another thing. That's kind of, like I say, it's a corollary with, it's the uncertainty in the system in the local case that makes a difference. So yes, there are anomalous situations that violate the rule set. 
but there's this psi uncertainty principle that says basically that psi uncertainty is a part of the rule set. It represents an entanglement of uncertainty with the measurement of psi effects. Okay, you can force your virtual reality to exceed the limits and functions of its defining rule set, but only if sufficient uncertainty remains in the system. There must always be plausible deniability, right? Legal term. Plausible deniability that the rule set was actually violated. Okay? That's the problem you see with the four doctors all doing the biopsy and coming to that decision. There's a very little plausible deniability anymore. You know, that's hard to change. Before, when it was just a lump, there was a lot of uncertainty you could deal with. Then it didn't take a miracle. After you get the four biopsies, now it takes a miracle, you see. It's different. Okay, it's the way the reality works. All right, I think you'll find this one interesting. The false appearance of backward causality. Many of you should be aware of backward causality. There's been a bunch of experiments done over oh, probably 40 or 50 years. Books have been written. Uh, it's, a, it's a major scientific mystery, okay? The first one that I know of was done in Israel. It was done, I think, with a group of rabbis who got hospital records and analyzed the hospital records. What they did is, uh, and this isn't exactly what they did. I'm just characterizing it so that it's simple to understand the basics of, of what went on. Just like the, the way I explained the uh, double slit experiment. It wasn't necessarily the way the experiment was done. It was just to bring out the character of it so that you could easily understand what was significant about it. So let's say that they had 20,000 hospital patients, records. These records went back over two decades, 20 years of hospital records. They took these records, 20,000 of them, they broke them into groups of 1,000 each. So now you have 20 groups of 1,000. Out of these 20 groups of 1,000, each group was then broken into 500. Two true groups of 500. When I say broken into, I mean randomly broken into. You know, they were, they were randomly chosen to be in the, this group of 500 or the other group. One of those groups of 500 was the control group, and the other was an active group that they were going to try to improve the health of those people. So these rabbis and others that used focused intent sat around and took this one group of 500 and tried very hard to instill health. They were very healthy. You know, they had short stays in the hospital, you know, good health and so on. So they did that, and what they found out to their great surprise, or I don't know, I, I would have been surprised, but they found out that the group that they prayed for health, the group that they worked on with their minds, had shorter hospital stays. Not only shorter, but statistically significantly shorter. Okay, if you know about statistics, you know that means the probability that happened just by chance was like less than 10%. You know, you don't get statistical significance mostly until it's like 5%, 10% at least, it's a 90%. So they did that and that was kind of amazing because they said, well, how did we change? How do we shorten these hospital stays? These patients have been out of hospital for 10 to 20 years. How do we do that? And that came to be known as reverse causality. It actually caused something to change in the past. And that's the way it was reported. So then they said, well, what if we can do it again? So they took the next group of 100, because when people looked at that, they said, well, OK, look, you know, statistics are like that. And you only have 500 in your sample. You know, all right, you may have been statistically significant just by luck. OK, there is that 10%. You may have fallen in that 5% that or that 10% anyway. So they did it again. Same result. Did it again. Same result. So they do all 20 of these. And now they have 20 of them, and they've biased the length of the hospital stay to the short side in all 20. Okay, well, the first one was like, all right, you know, that happens in statistics. But 20 of them in a row is like flipping a coin 20 times, getting heads every time. Now you're up to about one in a million. They're actually doing something here. And that was the beginning of these experiments. And these experiments have been done in a lot of different ways. They've been done with radioactive decay. They had a radioactive source. They had two Geiger counters, equidistant, you know, opposite sides. Radioactive decay goes out of this nucleus, equal probability in any direction. So you would think over time that both Geiger counters would have an equal number of, of hits. And uh, they had this data, and this data was a couple of years old, and they had people use their intent. And sure enough, after they used their intent, they look at the data and do the analysis, and this Geiger counter had a lot more hits than that one. 
a lot more than it should have had. Because everything, of course, has some randomness with it, right? Had they not done anything, there would have been some plus or minus that everybody would have said, yeah, that's, that's OK. We expect little variations. But you no, know, the Geiger counters, we're talking now not about 500, but we're talking suddenly our numbers have gone up. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions. You know, so they should be real, real close. And they weren't. So then they thought they'd do it the other way. And it worked as well. They could make that Geiger counter get less counts on this old data. And that's been done, again, you know, this is stuff that's been done in major universities, very, very, uh, shall we say, uh, very, very uh, tight protocols. A very big mystery. Another one that they did, this is one in Princeton. It's on YouTube. You can see it. And the guy that was head of the Princeton Pear Lab, and they research kind of fringe things. Very good idea. You know, most people realize that breakthrough comes from the fringe. So if all you do is do your work in the middle, you're never going to do anything too important. You know, the real wow stuff that leads to something that's important is all starts out on the fringe. So they broke off a little piece of Princeton. Princeton's a very high level technical, you know, physics house. And uh, that's where Einstein worked, was out of Princeton. So they took this group and said, you go study the stuff on the fringe, you know, see if we can learn something uh, new. And they were doing this research. And they had a little robot that they built. And this little robot would do random motions. And it would move, you know, forward, backward, right or left, randomly. So they put it in the middle of a round table. And they'd let it go. And they'd let it go for days. And it would just sit there and, you know, just kind of like this in the table because all of its motions eventually would cancel out because they were random. Then they would apply an intent to that robot to have it get out of the middle of the table and walk across the table. And the robot would, oh, it'd still wander some, but it would walk off to one side of the table, fall off the table. And they had any number of graduate students practice on moving that robot off the table. And there's lots of videos of that little robot wandering off the table. And they repeated that experiment a lot. Okay, so what's going on here? What's the active ingredient? Well, let's go back to our patients. That's an easy one to look at. What they were doing was making a measurement of something that was still in the future. It had nothing to do with backward causality. They weren't changing the health of people who had gotten out of the hospital 10 or 20 years ago. What they were changing was what was still in the future and still had uncertainty about it. That was the statistics. That was the data they'd gotten from the hospital records. Nobody had ever done the statistics on that data. Nobody knew what the hospital, stay, you know, what the average hospital stay was. That was an unknown. It was uncertain. So that's what they were biasing. They were biasing the data. Okay, now that suddenly raises some problems, doesn't it? They're biasing the data so that the data that they changed the probability of how that data would come out, where that median would be, that average hospital stay, was being modified. They take the data out. They do the statistics, find out what the median hospital stay is, and this one's shorter than that one. Okay, so that's what's being changed. Now, in order to test that, they gave them data that had already been calculated, data that they had looked at, done the statistic. They knew exactly to 10 decimal places what the median hospital stay was in both groups of 500 give it to the rabbis, and they couldn't move it. They couldn't change it at all. Well, the data was already in this reality frame. OK, so that would be meddling with history and the rule set to suddenly have it change. You know, here it was measured, and then you measure it again, and it's different. That's a violation. Once it's here, it's here. Okay? They could not change it. They even tried longer and harder with that data, could not change it. Now, here's an experiment that wasn't done, that could be done. Let's say they just ahead of time took the median of all 1,000. So they know what the median hospital stay was for the 1,000. Then they randomly break it into groups of 500. And then they let the rabbis, whoever, work on that group of 500. Could they change it? Yes. But what would also have to change, as much as this group had shorter hospital stays, that other group would have to have longer hospital stays because we know what the total is. Can't change that. We could change the pieces, but not the total result. 
So that would be a good experiment to do. So you move one this way, the other moves the other way. And if you, let's say, just took the whole group of 20,000 and did the statistics on those, okay, now, the stuff, now you broke them into all of these 20 groups of whatever, into 500, we did all that, that would put another constraint on it, a different one. Things could move around, but you'd have the constraint that the ensemble, the whole bunch of them, would have to come to the same value. So somewhere over all 20 groups, you'd have to have as much change to one side as the other, but not necessarily in any one group, you see? So that's just the way the reality works. It's statistical. The results were in the future, the results of this data analysis. All right, now what about the, um, you know, what about the uh, decays? Of course, they work exactly the same way. Now, this brings up a very interesting idea that if you have this cultural belief about this being an objective reality, that it should hit you right away, and that is the data and the happening don't necessarily have to correspond. You see, we believe in this objective reality that the data that we have has to represent exactly what happened. Well, the data says that this one uh, Geiger counter got 10% more counts than the other one. Well, that's impossible, isn't it? Because that radioactive thing doesn't, doesn't do that. Okay, and you can measure that source all day long and it doesn't, that doesn't happen. Okay, so how did that happen? See, real big mystery. Well, the fact is that the data doesn't have to mirror what happened. There's no backwards causality. It's not that they caused that radioactive source to be goofy in the past. It's not that they caused those Geiger counters to be strange in the past. It's not that they caused those patients to have better or worse health in the past. They're just modifying the data that's in the future to when it comes into the present. Now, what does this say about the scientific method? What does this say about, you know, all the research that's done, right? Scientists out there are doing, doing work and collecting data. Do any of those scientists have a, a wish, have a, have a drive for that data coming out this way rather than that way, or are they all just, mm, you know, however the data comes out, that's all right with me, I just want to know? Most of the time, not. Most of the time, they're doing an experiment. If it comes out this way, wow, you know, my career is going to really go because that would be exciting. If it comes out this other way, well, you know, nothing. I think it'll be exciting. That's why I'm doing the experiment. So a lot of times, your researchers are biased toward the outcome. But we don't care because we know that doesn't affect anything, right? <laughs> so, you know, there, there's no effect there. Scientific method, you know, doesn't have to worry about that. But you see, it does. So now our whole scientific method, you see, is question. It doesn't really work. Okay, now, there are certain groups of people that figured that out because they deal with more uncertain systems. And who are those? Those are what the, the, the hard sciences call the soft sciences, you know, like uh, um, psychology, sociology, all those things. And when they deal with people who we know have a lot of uncertainty, they had to modify the scientific method. Why? Because their, sci their, their experiments kept being biased. So what did they do to modify the scientific method? Double blind, right? They had to do that. They had to not know what they were actually doing, you know? Otherwise, they would bias the results. And it was shown over and over again that their attitudes did bias the results. Again, it was like how they held their mouth or, you know, how they, uh, how they moved or their posture. Or, you know, people pick up these tiny clues and gives them great insight. You know, that doesn't happen that way. We're not constructed that way. We don't, we don't react that much to these tiny clues. What was happening was they were biasing the experiments with their intent. They were biasing what the other people did with their intent. And they realized that if they didn't do double blind, they couldn't depend on anything. Even double blind, you see, that fixes some of their problem, but it doesn't fix all of their problem. Because even double blind, that experimenter knows how he wants that data to come out to make his career work better. There's still influence in it. Another point. Let's say that these hospital records, let's say that we have this, this hospital records, and a guy takes all the records, and he does all the statistics. He breaks them up into all these groups that we talked about. He has this 20 groups of 1,000, uh, and then the, the five, each 1,000 group into 500. He does all the statistics on it. He knows exactly what the average hospital stay was in every group. 
Now, of course, if people got that data, they couldn't move it because the data's already here. But let's say that he takes that data, he did that analysis on his calculator, and he leaves the office, the office burns down. All the data is burnt. You know, it all tabulated on papers in his desk, and it all got burned up. Okay, now the records that he got it from are still over in the mainframe in another building. They're not damaged, but nobody's done the statistics on that data. Just the data he did the statistics on is what got destroyed. So now what do you think? Are we back in, the, back in the game again? Yes, of course. I remember there used to be a movie called Back to the Future. That's what happened. The results of that data just went back to the future. Now you could take that data because nobody really knows what the outcome's going to be. Nobody knows. You know, they break that up into groups, even if it's the exact same groups. Nobody knows what the hospital studies were on those groups. And yes, the rabbis could bias it just like they did the other ones. So it came here, was in our reality frame for a while, went back to the future. So things can come and go. It's not just a one-way street. Entropy has a way of erasing the tracks in the sand, right? Entropy has a way of, of losing data. Okay, so the same logic that derives quantum mechanics derives talking to your plants, creating a parking space, intent-based healing, intent-based anything, power of positive thinking, law of attraction. That reality starts out as probability until brought into this physical reality by an observation or measurement, and that's a fundamental nature of reality. So it's not just something that only applies at the microscopic level. You see, I started with that on Friday. told you that we we're going to show you that quantum mechanics is a general principle. It applies to everything, not just the microscopic level. Okay, potential existence remains in the probable future until a measurement's made that collapses its wave function into a physical measurement. Once the data becomes part of the physical reality, consistency is required. Okay, so now let's talk about another limitation. Remember we said that you have to be within the, the history and the rule set, and that that also means you have to be within the natural uncertainty of the data. So there was no way that those rabbis were going to make, let's say, everybody in a group of 500 get out of the hospital in an hour. So that isn't going to happen. That's way outside the normal randomness. Just like they weren't going to use their intent and make that brick, you know, be an extra inch long, because it's not going to happen. That's outside of the plus or minus. So you can only modify within the probability. So you can move things. You can stretch the point. But you stretch the point within the natural uncertainty. So that brings us back to the beer and refrigerator. Where there is a lot of natural uncertainty, there are multiple solutions to the problem. OK. Some ramifications. There are two main drivers to this, and we've mentioned those. Physical reality is not rendered. It remains in the probable future until a measurement's made to make it necessary to render it. You know, that was like the tree in the forest, right? We didn't render that tree. Lying down on the ground until the guy walked in, he saw it lying down there. He'd walked in 20 years later, he may have just sawn a little bit of rotten, you know, wood lying on the floor of the forest. He wouldn't have seen that tree. He walked in much further than that, there may have been no signs that there was ever a tree there. His the probability would be that there wasn't one. So let's talk about different scales. Okay, baseballs versus electrons. You have a baseball, and Let's say this baseball gets thrown someplace. There's a certain amount of uncertainty in that trajectory, isn't there? But even Newtonian physics does a real good job of computing that, probably to three or four decimal places. But there's some uncertainty because that ball isn't a perfect sphere. That ball doesn't have you know perfect surface that's always uniform everywhere. And it will maybe interact with the air differently. It may move this way or that way. There's a little bit of randomness maybe in, in if it was thrown out of some kind of ball throwing machine, there'd be randomness in, in a machine. But it doesn't have much randomness. So the randomness, we'll say in that baseball, is tiny. We're talking about maybe plus or minus millimeters or plus or minus centimeters, depending on how far that, that randomness gets extrapolated. Okay, but electrons, which is where we see it happening, right, down at the microscopic level. Now here's an electron, and it's about this big. And it's uncertainty goes plus or minus infinity. So now we're starting to see something that's small that has this you know, probability of location that's spread all over the place. So it's a different thing. That's why we see it in little particles and we don't notice it in big things. But it's the same all over at every scale. 
any process that has uncertainty in it, like ballistic trajectories, you know, whether or not your mother-in-law comes to live with you, you know, all these are processes that have uncertainty in them. Okay? Any of those you can modify with your mind. Now there's a thing called uh, ballistics. You have statistical processes going on inside the barrel of a gun. Okay? When a gun fires, the bullet obviously can't be contained so tight that it can't get out of the bullet, so it's got to have some wiggle room in there. It's got to have a little bit of wobble room. And the gases that are expanding behind it don't always expand in exactly the same way. They don't all get the same amount of energy. There's a lot of random things. So if you take a gun and you put it in concrete so it can't move, and you fire 100 rounds, they'll all land in different places. They're not all going to land on top of each other, right? They're all going to be spread out, OK? That's called dispersion, ballistic dispersion because there's random events going on. Interior ballistics is what all those random events are referred to, the little uncertainties that go on inside the barrel of a gun. Actually, the gun barrel itself flexes a little bit, even if it's just internal, okay? And as it heats up, if you fire 100 rounds in a minute, that gun barrel gets hot. And as it gets hot, of course, it flexes different ways than when it's cold and so on. So you get a pattern. Well, that pattern can be affected. Here's another easy experiment, you know, let people Make, take that pattern, fire a thousand rounds, see the pattern, and then have people try to move that pattern a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. Should be able to do that, okay? Because that's a random thing going on. Now, what about those people that are out there that are exposed to all kinds of danger? You know, there's always these soldiers that have been in, you know, five tours of duty in war zones, and they never got as much as a bruise. You know, and there's this other guy who, you know, just gets there the day before, and he gets in the foxhole, and the shell lands in his foxhole, right? Why is it that we have these, these disparities? Sometimes it's just luck, but oftentimes it has to do with your attitude. It has to do with you. you know, we, we make our own luck in many ways because we modify probabilities based on our intent. Again, power of positive thinking. If you go into a dangerous situation thinking, I'm going to get hurt, I'm going to get hurt, this is going to be awful, you'll probably get hurt. That's the way that, uh, that works. Also, let's talk about while we're in this while we're in the same same category here and in the same uh, idea set. Let's talk about some other experiments. If you remember Bill Tiller, he was on the uh, down the rabbit hole. Did a lot of talking there. He's a physicist. He does some experiments with pH. They're on the they're on YouTube as well. And what he does is he gets a glass of water, just beaker of water out of his spigot, near pH seven, right, neutral. Well, it could be a little this way or that, but anyway, he measures it, a very sensitive pH measure. And then he gets somebody to use their intent to move the pH up. And after a while, he's been able to move that pH a whole unit, you know, like from seven to eight or from seven to six. Well, that's a huge motion in pH. You know, it's a significant motion if he moves it up at 0.1, but he moves it up a whole unit. And he's done this many, many times, and he has it you know, recorded in a lot of data and good protocols. He's a good scientist. How does he do that? Well, the pH of that water is not a flat 7. The pH of that water is changing every, every millisecond. It's different. Why? Because you have little H pluses and little OH minuses combining, recombining, breaking off, you know, water breaking down, other, other molecules going together. If you looked at that pH on a microscopic level, it's, it's like this, like any other natural process. It's all over the place. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a wiggly curve. There's uncertainty. Inside that uncertainty, he can bias it. And then a minute later, he can bias that. A minute later, he can bias that. It's cumulative. You see, it's the same thing in making that little robot walk off the table. The way that was done is that every random number that got generated had, a, had an uncertainty in it. Could be anywhere from, from you know, zero to, to one. And you just make more of them come out to be just a little bigger than the 0.5 average, and the robot walks off the table. You make every one of those measurements, or every time you, know, you think about that pH of that water, you may go up just a hair, just within the natural uncertainty, but you can add those up to where you get a whole pH you know, unit up or down, make it go either way. That's how that works. See, right now, that's a big mystery. We know Bill Tiller does it, but nobody has a clue how he could possibly do that, how that works. There's a guy also on YouTube, a, a Japanese scientist who freezes water. He freezes this water, and 
you know, you've heard the thing, there's no two snowflakes alike. Well, that's because when water freezes, there's a very large number of ways that the patterns can form when water freezes. There's lots of uncertainty is what that means. Okay, well, where there's lots of uncertainty, it's easy to manipulate. So he freezes water, and as that water freezes, he thinks happy thoughts, and he thinks unhappy thoughts. He plays music, he plays Bach and Beethoven, and he plays acid rock. And then he looks at the patterns of how the water freezes. And of course, when he plays nice music, he gets pretty crystals, you know, very symmetric, and he shows these on the, on the screen. And then when he plays some kind of awful, horrible music, he gets these ugly conglomerates of ice that, you know, look terrible. And when he swears at the ice, it looks awful. And when he loves the ice, it's pretty. And it goes on and on. He does all this stuff. And he gets his people to do it, too. And the ice crystals, you know, they change based on what he does. Well, it has nothing to do with what kind of music the water likes. That's like the backwards, you know, the backwards you know, causality. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with this guy in his mind and what kind of music he likes. If he loved acid rock, He'd get pretty little crystals when the acid rock was playing. If he hated Beethoven and that made him angry, you know, he'd get ugly crystals when Beethoven played. It's what made him happy. Well, of course, what happens is that scientists will come in and they'll take Bill Tiller's beacon of water and they'll take this guy's ice crystal and they'll go take it and they'll say, well, I froze the stuff and I swore at the ice. Didn't make any difference. Well, I took it and I, made, you know, I, I cooed and loved the ice and it didn't make any difference. It's all bogus. They'll take Bill Tiller's experiment. They'll do the same thing. So we set up the tiller, we set up the water, and we said, "Okay, water, get more acid, get more base." It didn't make any difference. It's all bogus. These guys are liars. It's not the case. You see, we don't live in an objective reality. Not just anybody can have the effect. It takes somebody that has a trained intent that can focus it and get the noise out of their mind. It takes persistence. So no. The experiment, or the scientific method says, well, if it's valid, anybody can do it anywhere. Otherwise, it's not valid. There's a trick going on someplace. Somebody's made a mistake if it isn't the same everywhere. We are not the same. We're all different. We all have different abilities. Everyone's unique. It's not the same. What about other things? Uh, sports. What do we know about sports? Any athlete that's at the top of his game, like uh, Olympic level athlete, will tell you, that about 80 or 90 percent of whether he gets no medal or a gold medal has to do with his mind. It would tell you that that level of training, it's mostly in the mind. Well, why is, why is that? Well, he has to see the future. When that archer pulls back that arrow, it's not about how he holds his fingers and how he lets go of the string and that sort of thing. That's all technique. It's down at the you know, medium level. He has his mind focused on what's going to happen. His mind is focused on that arrow hitting the bullseye. There's all sorts of uncertainty in that, even in the travel and the air and the feathers. And things are not symmetric arrows and perfectly straight and so on. He focuses his mind on where, that arrow, where he wants that arrow to hit. And any archer who's good will tell you that that's a very important part of it. He can't have somebody talking to him breaking his concentration while he's doing this, or he won't do very well. And it's not because that makes him wobble his arms. It's because he loses his concentration of his intent and his focus. That's what's important. Even if you're doing shot put or throwing the javelin or running, whatever it is you're doing, athletic or swimming, the edge, what makes you good, is you're focusing on that intent of what happens and how it comes out. Okay, we have the scientific method, and it's basically the philosophical foundation of Western culture, and it's fundamentally flawed. Like objectivity and determinism, it's only an approximation. It's only good approximation sometimes. It fits sometimes. When our world is a good approximation to being objective, then the Scientific method is a good approximation to being a good method. Okay, but that's, remember how we said, like with the, you know, with Newtonian physics, it's a good approximation in, in the area where it works, but it doesn't work in other areas. Well, that's the way our normal physics is now, too. It's a good approximation in certain areas, but doesn't work too well in other areas. Doesn't work at all for Bill Tiller, you know, and, uh, and the reverse causality and that sort of stuff. It can't understand any of those things. So, people and their interactions are filled with uncertainty a whole lot compared to machines. 
Okay, that's why they need a double blind. Okay, but it's impossible to eliminate all the prejudice. So the experimenter has to be aware of the experiment. There's no way to have an experimenter that's not aware that he's doing an experiment, right? That's impossible. And often the experimenter is not detached from the results. Most of the time they're not detached from the results. So the so-called hard sciences think they're immune from such effects because they work with stuff and not with people. They don't have to worry about double blind because their equipment doesn't need that sort of thing. But you see they have the same problem. Does anybody remember about a decade ago we had cold fusion? A bunch of scientists, reputable scientists from good universities, experienced cold fusion. Oh, it was a really big deal. Well, you know, if you're a scientist, you don't stand up and say, I just did cold fusion, you know, in public, unless you're really, really sure that you've done it, because that would ruin your reputation, which is generally what happens when you do that. So they were sure, and they repeated the experiments, they repeated them again, and they were sure that they had it, so they made the announcement. Everybody was thrilled, and other people went out to duplicate it. It didn't duplicate. You see, there's uncertainty in everything. There's uncertainty in the people who operate the machine. There's uncertainty in the machines. There's uncertainty in a lot of the, they were doing stoichiometric processes with gases and things, and there's a lot of uncertainty in those things. They would like, who wouldn't like to see cold fusion? You know, that would be wonderful, solve our energy problems. There was a lot of very positive intent on those things coming out, but it wasn't other people who just wanted to, didn't have a dog in the fight, right? They just wanted to duplicate it. They just put it out there and you know, see if they could duplicate it. Didn't work. So that's a, that's a problem. Results are dependent on the intent of those associated in some way with the experiment. All uncertainty combined, uncertainty in process, equipment, theory, materials, human error, and various competing intents. There's another group of scientists that want that group to fail because they're working on something similar, but they're behind. Well. You know, you can heal another person with intent, right? You can modify the probability. It's not just you. So you have these competing intents. So you see, it's a very complex world that we live in, but it's not objective, and it's not deterministic, but it is complex. Okay, psi researchers are particularly confounded by applying a logically flawed scientific method to an area filled with uncertainty. I mean, the psi business is just uncertainty all over the place, right? They have repeatability problems. Reality is not objective or deterministic. Okay. Hard science calls it bogus because research results conflict with current scientific belief. 